so my I was asked today to to talk a bit about my studies about um, assessment procedures um, uh, for professorships, uh, and I will share my my screen, um, <clears throat> which is a project that was done some years ago. There's still some publications uh, coming out of that that project, um, uh, and I will speak uh, about three or four different studies uh, that I did together with, with colleagues. Um, so <clears throat> before I start with the actual presentation, I also want to emphasize that the work I'm presenting here was done together with, with colleagues, uh, mostly uh, Sara de Reike and foremost with Alexander Rushford, uh, who is also present at the seminar today. So maybe he can he can answer some questions that uh, if they're really tricky, he will, <laughs> he will answer them. No, but this was really a collaborative work done uh, when I was a postdoc at, at, uh, uh, in Leiden and also a bit after that, uh, that period. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, my idea for, for the talk today is to say something more generally about, about assessment of academic careers. I mean, this is a, it's a big topic and I'm not the first one to, to study it. And there are also quite a lot of work coming out now. I think there is a, a growing interest into these issues and how these kind of evaluations shape uh, academic work and, and um, priorities and research more generally. Um, I would then like to say something about disciplinary differences and, and different kind of what we call judgment devices. That was a, a concept that uh, uh, I, I used together with, with Alex Rusford in, in one of our, our papers um, and connect that to uh, the idea of citizen bibliometrics, which is a concept developed by Paul Voters and also Lute Lederstorff, who is also present at, at the seminar. Um, and after that, I would like to say something about temporality in evaluation, how temporality comes into these kind of evaluations. Uh, and after that, some, some points for discussion that could be something to, to think about uh, in the sense of a broader discussion of what these studies might mean. Um, <clears throat> But first, then, what, what made me interested in the assessment of academic careers was, was a start of a debate uh, in the Netherlands and also elsewhere about the problem with evaluating researchers only on the basis of their publications or their citation scores. Um, there was a movement called Science in Trans Transition, which I think is still active, maybe transformed on under other names now, which basically said that we don't get maybe the best researcher or the best kind of research done if we only evaluate researcher based on how many publications and how many citations they have. They must also have maybe efforts to contribute to society in a broader sense and, and so forth. And these kind of problems were then all discussed in terms of how researchers were hired, because um, it was said, especially in biomedicine, that researchers were hired ba mostly based on, on, on these kind of, of scores, and that, for example, journal impact factors were used uh, to, to select uh, the best um, candidates for these positions. And as you may know, the competition for prestigious positions within many disciplines are really harsh. So there could be 50 or 60 applicants. Uh, so there's a fierce battle for these, for these uh, positions. Um, <clears throat> so we wanted to look at assessment procedures and why we found this interesting was because it's a high stake context, context where indicators have major influence. So we have quite a lot of studies of different kind of evaluation systems on the institutional level, but maybe these kind of evaluations on the individual level have much, much more impact on the careers, and maybe then are also have more influence over decisions made. 
So the idea was that a researcher might be much more prone to publish in a certain way if they know that their, their future as professionals depend on, on these choices. Um, another thing that made them interesting from, from my perspective is that when you look at assessment procedures, there's a meeting between disciplinary culture in terms of how you evaluate and a more general culture of evaluation that meet in this kind of, of evaluations. And luckily in Sweden, these kind of evaluations, because they're part of, of, of the government, uh, of the state, you can access them to what's called the offentlighetsprincip. And so you can, actually, you can ask the universities to give you these kind of evaluations because it's a government decision, then it should be available to anyone asking for it. And I also think they are interesting in the sense that these kind of evaluation becomes norms for how researchers are evaluated uh, in terms of good scholarship. And there are also some examples of, of these kind of studies uh, done uh, before. Um, so I just want to emphasize here that it's just one little part of the uh, evaluation re recruitment process that we actually look at in these documents. So it's the referee reports that are written by external examiners. So these are part and a, an important part of the evaluation, but it's m many steps before uh, and after uh, that needs to be done before uh, actual hiring is, is made. Um, and there is also a committee listening to, to uh, for example, lectures or making an interview before the decision is made. Um, so the material that we used for most of these studies uh, were about 180 reports from uh, four universities in Sweden. Um, we had most reports for biomedicine being a larger discipline. And the definition of biomedicine is also a bit more complicated than economics, but I won't go into that. But uh, uh, so we had about 100, 180 reports. These could be anywhere from two, three pages to 40 pages long. Many of them written in English, but some in, in, in Swedish. Um, and what we looked at uh, in, in, in the study, in the first study uh, that we did was um, looking for what we call judgment devices. And we borrowed this co concept from, from Karpik. Uh, and it's also a concept that uh, Alex Rosford and Sarah Reike used before, and also Mussolini have used this in her, her studies. Um, but the basic idea of judgment devices is that when you have uh, a market uh, where you have goods that cannot easily be compared, so a car, for example, can be easily compared with another car. You can look at the number of horsepowers or the number of seats or different equipments. But when, when you want to compare books, like literary books or dentists or uh, researchers in this case, you need these kind of judgment devices in order to separate them. Uh, and I won't go into all the different judgment devices, but appellations is one typical judgment device, which is a brand or a standard, it's a mark. You could say that a, a journal, a journal for example, can be kind of a brand. Nature is a, is a brand to some degree. Uh, and rankings, which we know quite a lot about in, in bibliometrics. It's a hierarchical list produced by uh, either buyers or, or by experts. And in this case, we use this theory of judgment devices to understand why and how bibliometric indicators are used to reach different uh, decisions. Uh, and <clears throat> using this theory then on, on uh, the three disciplines that we looked at, we also looked at history. It was not, uh, we had also 40 uh, cases from history uh, in another study. Um, uh, I we looked at this and we could see that the most common uh, way to do this evaluation was to use brands. So you looked at the reputation of a journal, the journal as a brand. Um, 
but in, in biomedicine and also in economics, impact factors was another way of making the evaluation. Um, but also citations, which is kind of a buyer's ranking. It's a popularity contest if we, if we simplify it. Uh, and also prices, for example, uh, which is kind of an expert ranking of, of candidates. Um, so the large difference here between the, the topics is that economics use rankings to a much higher degree than biomedicine, while history doesn't use metrics in the types of citations, for example, at all. While reputation of publishers, for example, of books could be an important way to, to distinguish between candidates. Um, so what we found was that this kind of judgment device is dependent on the organization of research field and publication practices. Uh, the agreements on goals and, and the methods in biomedicine allows for extensive use of metrics in both disciplines because they researchers tend to agree on what should count as good research. And then they can also agree on what kind of judgments and devices should be used to evaluate, evaluate uh, research. Uh, especially then we could see that the journal impact factor uh, is part of disciplinary evaluation practices, sometimes even in a form that it's disguised. So they talk about high ranked journal, for example, but then we know that the journal impact factor is behind that statement. Economics on the other hand has a very strong agreement on, on certain types of rankings, the ABS ranking, for example, which is highly influential and which are usually referred to in, in these kinds of do documents. And if you look at, at actual numbers, you could see that <clears throat> citation counts uh, were mentioned most often in biomedicine uh, with H index being quite often used as well and the journal impact factor. While in economics, um, citation counts and journal rankings were the most common metrics used across these documents. And what we count here is just a formal use of, of, of metrics. Uh, so it has to be, uh, you can't just mention that something is, uh, is highly cited, for example, or that something is influential. Um, so one way then of using these indicators as judgment devices was some kind of benchmarking. So saying that all of these publications have an impact factor greater than three, for example, then you have set a certain level. In economics, on the other hand, the journal impact factor is less useful, which is illustrated by this quote, saying that any journal impact factor over 0 0.5 is considered to be highly ranked. And this, I think, could also explain why ra journal rankings are more important here, because the journal impact factor is not as useful for making these kind of benchmarks. Um, especially in biomedicine, the uh, rankings, the H index could be one way which in the candidate's position is, is totalized. Uh, you don't have to even compare different kind of, of, of indicators. And especially in one of the cases that we found, the recommendation made had a very nice correlation with, with the H index that was given for each uh, candidate. So if you had the, the candidates having 21 to 25 were qualified for a professorship and 26 to 32 were fully qualified. And this actually quite nicely corresponds to what Hirsch actually said in his, in his paper that you need 18 for advancement to full professor, which is, I wouldn't say that it's proof that the H index works, but uh, certainly have, it seems to be correspond to this, the ranking made in, in this particular document. Um, what we also try to do here is to understand, not only see how metrics is used, but actually see how researchers use their knowledge of metrics. Um, and then we use the concept of citizen bibliometrics, which I personally think is a better concept than, than um, bibliometric competency or, or literacy. 
because it says something about um it's nothing we can't teach citizen bibliometrics that would be my claim to research it because it's something that they possess within their discipline um so it was used at least in our interpretation to to actually problematize the the idea of expert and amateur bibliometrics which has been quite common in our field and by showing how citizen bibliometrics is performed we want to see how this concept could be used to actually explain how bibliometrics is, uh, is used by researchers themselves. Um, and it could also be related to ideas about academic citizenships, that this kind of uh, being a, a, a good bibliometric citizen is to know when to use these metrics and how to use them. Uh, so, one way we could see this being expressed is how you actually argument for be using metrics. Um, so one argument made uh, is that this is actually a real scientific impact. I think this was more common perhaps in the biomedicine. Um, and uh, it can also be used as an argument for saying that, well, we need to be economic. We need to to uh, actually use information that is not only narrative to, to make these kind of, of, uh, of decisions, especially when we have a lot of, a lot of um, applications uh, to deal with. Um, and the authors also, uh, the authors of these documents, the assessors of, of, di of different uh, applications uh, for professorships could also discuss metrics quite explicitly explicitly so like in this case case when you actually say that well bibliometrics is not perfect um and it you can't be used for detailed ranking but you can do some kind of first sorting and here it says it could be described as a scale that can distinguish an elephant from a rabbit but not a horse from a cow so basically you could use it for a first way of, of screening screening the candidates um Another way in which these uh, um, colleagues doing the assessments, uh, you show their, their knowledge about bibliometrics is to say, well, we have to understand in that in these kind of journals, nuclear medicine journals in this case, you can't really expect high impact journals. So the best journals are, uh, often have a uh, lower impact factor, for example. So this is a way of, of showing that they know how these metrics play out in their, their particular field. Um, they can also use um, bibliometrics to compare different kind of numbers. So in this case, we have a candidate that has low citation rate, but a high age index, which basically means she has a lot of publications with moderate citation scores, not low ones, but enough to, to reach a certain level. So the, the, it's not uncommon to have these kind of, of, of comparison and what these kind of numbers compared to each other says about the, about the candidates. And of course, you can make it even more complex by having these kind of, of uh, very ambitious tables where different kind of measures, and this is also in biomedicine, for example, first and second authorship, um, uh, citation rate, median citation rate, uh, age index, or all these kind of numbers are stacked upon each other. And we also have here the other senior author. So if you co-author too much with your supervisor, that would be something that's not so good for your score, for example. So this is a way to to, to have all the numbers and then compare them in order to, to end up with a, with a ranking. So what we basically argue here <clears throat> is uh, that the examiners show expertise in, in three different respects. They are domain experts in their field on the topic, but they're also to some degree met metrics experts, but most importantly then, experts in how these kind of metrics is valued within their own field. 
So it's not only as, as uh, it's been said in the literature that they simply trust the numbers, they actually do things with the numbers. And this is what we would call uh, citizen bibliometrics then. <clears throat> so I see that I've taken a bit too much time for this initial part of the talk, so I will try to, to speed up a bit. Um, to come to the, to the second, to another study and the second claim we make about these documents and evaluations, and there is the idea of trajectory, that careers form a trajectory and certain trajectories are valued higher than other trajectories. Um, and here in this study, we looked more at how actually uh, these evaluation reports are structured and written, the kind of narrative which, which they form and how this narrative infrastructure, which we you a concept on Deuton and Rip uh, uses for understanding how these documents actually work. Um, and in this sense, they, these kind of evaluation reports is a genre that is similar to biographies, obituaries, uh, and, and CVs, for example. This, they follow a certain way of describing uh, academic careers. Um, and we can see this uh, when reading this kind of, of document. So in the first, um, there is a question here if, this applicant got off to a brilliant start, but will they be able to achieve the same kind of success in the future? So there is a, a trajectory here, but it's uncertain how it will develop. There's also descriptions of the high flying model career trajectory, which shows um, an ever increasing number of metrics as in the second example here. So the metrics we argue are, are part of making and describing these, uh, these trajectories. And it should be said that this study mostly focused on biomedicine because biomedicine has a specific kind of trajectory uh, or, or um, uh, idle trajectory that researchers are supposed to, to follow. So, there is also what we call mixed record of performance, uh, these kind of descriptions in the material, where uh, an author can be said to be having a lot of papers, but maybe not in the most prestigious journals, but with significant citation scores. So this is kind of a mixed picture of, of it's not a high flying model, but it's still a very good, good performance. We also find the description of a declining career trajectory, um, where there is a decrease in scientific productivity without any real explanation. And this will, of course, be very damaging for this candidate. Um, and what's interesting, uh, and we did find a few examples of this, is the way to kind of making careers and also lives then comparable. And it's, um, an attempt to take in the time uh, aspect by, for example, um, taking away the, the parental leave time and also look at the time since PhD defense to actually be able to compare trajectories for candidates that are at different career st stages, for example. Um, <clears throat> and this is a, a, a more illustrative image used by one of the reviewers uh, in uh, one of the documents. So they have been very ambitious here and put in different kinds of, of um, parts of the career track. So you have the years uh, above here on, on uh, and then on, on the axis, you have the different kind of numbers for papers, for example. So you could see, for example, the one in pink, uh, single as the first paper, uh, and then you have docent and, and uh, so forth. So here you can actually see these kind of careers illustrated uh, graphically. So our conclusion from this then 
was that you could see um, quite clear stories being made here. So in, it's the it's a story from dependence to autonomy. So you should should show that you're independent of your of, of your uh, supervisors. Uh, it's from apprentice to mastery. Uh, um, it's the uh, it's a risk of getting caught in the middle in the in, in the middle position as as an author, for example, and you can have to abandon the high flying career trajectory. And there is some kind of idea into this tractorism, uh, which is linked to efficiency. You should be efficient with the time that you had uh, as, as a researcher. And you should also be a good investment then for the, for the hiring institution. Um, there's also an idea of a track record that actually could say something about future uh, performance. Um, and there is also maybe uh, a, a particular masculine norm expressed in the idle career trajectory in terms of movement, in terms of how, how these kind of, of, of uh, research should be done. And showing independence, for example, and not very much related to teaching and administration. And we think that may, uh, this kind of, of ideal career track might be problematic for individuals that doesn't live up really to, to uh, uh, these demands and lead to, to a mismatch between the actual live lives uh, of individuals and the kind of research, uh, the kind of, of uh, uh, careers that are valued in science. So, um, coming to an end and formulating some kind of questions for the, for the discussion, um, maybe we see a historical development of evaluation of, of, uh, for academic positions and for academic careers. There is um, uh, at least a movement towards more narrative, story-based evaluation uh, where you should take in uh, much more context. Uh, and as uh, Hamann and Kaltenbrunner just showed in, in a recently published paper uh, about uh, evaluation in, in German, uh, in, in history in Germany from 1950s, the kind of narrative format for evaluating research and uh, describing your, your career was more common in the 1950s and 60s. Maybe this is something that we're going back to if we want to abandon the metrics. Um, another question is if discussions on the door and Leiden Manifesto uh, will um, actually, <clears throat> actually um, make any larger changes to how we evaluate researchers. I would say that these kind of norms are global and used by many so is it enough if some institutions try to use other strategies, other ways to evaluate researchers? So another question is if, if we abandon the journal impact factor or the H index, the, those access, uh, assessing uh, researchers will still need some kind of shortcuts or judgment devices. What would they be? Would, that, would they be better than the, than the metrics that we already use? And the final question is, if metrics always are bad for evaluating researchers, we know that if we allow for very, for just using narratives or, or, or interpretations or other ways of, of evaluating, we might have other types of biases coming into the processes. And sometimes disadvantaged groups uh, may have a benefit from us using metrics, which I wouldn't say they're objective, but they, have another kind of quality than, 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 than just narratives. Okay, that's all for me for, for now. I look forward to the, the discussion. Thank you.